the growth of the MRI and protoplanetary disks. I'll be focusing very much on the uh, linear analysis of the growth. Uh, Neil, in the subsequent talk, will be talking about nonlinear simulations and so on. So this should serve as a reasonable introduction to what he's going to talk about, not that we've uh, coordinated very much. Um, I think uh, what I like about protoplanetary disks is we have here a situation where we have real numbers. They're not necessarily hard numbers in the sense that we know exactly what some of them are, but we know they exist. <laughs> we have cross-sections with definite values and so on. The numbers really do have to work out in this situation if you want magnetic fields to do something interesting. Uh, and I think that's kind of why I like working on, on this stuff. Not that, you know, that doesn't make it easy to know what's happening because uh, the situation is rather complex. So I'll start just by uh, uh, introducing you to some of the numbers for the, uh, the kind of reference standard for protoplanetary disks, which is the minimum mass model of our own solar nebula, based on taking the planets in our solar system, adding enough hydrogen and helium to them to, to water everything down, their composition down to solar abundances, and then smearing stuff out a little to give you this surface density of about 1,700 grams per square uh, centimeter at 1 AU. Uh, that gives you a disk mass of about 2% of a solar mass. Uh, temperature you can guesstimate based on uh, absorption and re-emission of solar radiation by little uh, black body spheres. Uh, and that means the disk is going to be uh, geometrically thin and gravitationally stable, the Q value is about 17 and a half. So you can add of order 20 to 30 times more surface density before things go gravitationally unstable. So, so this is a minimum mass solar nebula. Um, you can uh, quite easily increase the surface density by a factor of 10 and it's still kind of a, a thin, nice, non-self-gravitating uh, disk. We do, of course, have some observations of disks around other stars, and if you analyze the uh, spectral energy distribution from kind of the infrared through to submillimeter and make suitable assumptions, then you get estimates of the surface density of the disks that's consistent, and the mass that's consistent with the minimum mass solar nebula, with a scatter of a few and various uncertainties. So it's a reasonable kind of uh, starting point and means you can estimate typical numbers and so on. Now, as far as magnetic activity goes in these disks, the primary feature of them is that they're very, very poorly conducting. Uh, the density is high, and the fractional ionization is very, very low. So it's quite difficult, actually, for the magnetic field to couple to the bulk of the matter because charged particles are, are so rare. Uh, and so the magnetic diffusion is controlled just by scattering of charged particles from neutrals, and that's where some of the real numbers come in. There's real cross-sections there that we can't just uh, arbitrarily kind of play with because we don't understand them. Uh, the other feature is that there are tremendous, uh, you know, this is true of other disks, of course, there's a tremendous amount of variation both in radially and particularly in this case uh, vertically primarily because the ionizing sources, for the most part, are outside the disk and the ionizing radiation has to come in from the surfaces and attempt to penetrate to the midplane and create enough charged particles for magnetic fields to do anything at all. So there's a very strong vertical stratification that I'll be uh, emphasizing. Um, <coughs> if you get close enough to the central object where presumably the disk is hotter, then thermal ionization can start to take over and kind of change the rules. Um, uh, it used to be thought that just cosmic ray ionization would be important in the outer regions of the nebula. It's since been realized and, you know, based on observations that uh, low mass stars are very uh, much magnetically active and generate a lot of x-rays because of reconnection, et cetera, occurring in their, uh, uh, in their corona. And the x-ray fluxes are such that the x-ray ionization dominates the cosmic ray ionization uh, by many orders of magnitude in the very surface layers of the disks. Um, <coughs> so the fact that we have so many neutral particles around means that magnetic diffusion is very important. So let me just uh, contrast the, uh, how diffusion, uh, the different regimes 
uh, that are going to be present in a weakly ionized disk and compare that to the fully ionized case that you might be more familiar with. So in ideal MHD, of course, ions and electrons in the fully ionized case are tied to the uh, magnetic field. Uh, and then if you try and shake the field at frequencies that are higher than the ion cyclotron frequency, then the ions become decoupled from those motions, but the electrons, because they have much less inertia, are not. And then you enter the regime of Hall MHD, where you get uh, interesting drifts between ions and electrons and the associated Hall currents. And then if there's enough, say, Coulomb scattering between ions and electrons, uh, they become decoupled from the field and give you the ohmic limit. Now imagine instead that your charged particles are embedded in a sea of neutrals and collisions, the dominant collisions, are not charged particle interactions with other charged particles, but just scattering off neutrals with well-defined cross-sections. Um, <coughs> there's still the ideal MHD limit where the ions and electrons, by colliding with the neutrals, are able to keep them also tied to the magnetic field. But if you increase, say, the frequency of... Uh, perturbations that you're thinking about, then you can kind of shake the neutrals off the field lines because uh, collisions are not strong enough uh, to keep them coupled, and you're in the regime of amber polar diffusion. That's important at kind of lower densities in molecular clouds and cloud cores, and in the lower density regions of protocellar disks. <coughs> uh, then uh, if you up the frequency that you're thinking about some more, then uh, ions start to become decoupled by collisions with the neutrals. Uh, now, what's interesting here, and there's some errors out there in the, uh, in the literature, not really the, astro -lit the mainstream astro literature, I've got to say, but um, you can think of the ions as being firmly attached to the neutrals by collisions. And so an individual ion, in a sense, picks up an associated mass of neutral particles with it. And so the effective ion gyro frequency, in this case, is much, much lower than the normal ion cyclotron frequency. So when you're trying to make an estimate of whether the Hall effect is important in this situation, do not use this frequency, use this one instead. Uh, and that's comparable with an orbital time, an AU, for example. And so this is a very important effect in protostellar disks. Uh, finally, at higher densities, electrons will also become decoupled by collisions from the magnetic field, and you're in the ohmic regime then. You end up with an induction equation that looks like this. You just have kind of the standard kind of diffusion tensor there with the ohmic, Hall, and amber polar parts. Uh, and it, it, suppose you pretend there's no dust grains present, so you just have ions and electrons. Then the expressions for the Hall and this is actually the Pedersen uh, frequency, which is uh, diffusivity, which is the sum. I haven't defined it here, unfortunately. It's the sum of the amber polar and ohmic diffusivity, are related by products of the uh, uh, relevant Hall parameters there. So it's uh, quite simple. The main thing to remember is that the ohmic diffusivity does not depend on magnetic field. The Hall picks up one factor of magnetic field, and the uh, Pedersen and amber polar tend to pick up two factors of B. So there's, impl there's uh, uh, linear and quadratic dependence on magnetic field strength hidden in those two uh, diffusion coefficients. Uh, there are then these three distinct diffusion regimes uh, can be uh, separated just looking at the ratio of B over N that determines the uh, compared gyro frequencies of particles with their collision frequencies of neutrals. And so uh, at lower densities or higher field strengths during the amber polar uh, regime, there's an intermediate Hall regime that's actually quite broad because there's about a ratio of a factor of order 2,000 between these two uh, Hall uh, parameters. And then at high densities, you're into the ohmic regime. And uh, Steve showed a plot like this already. If you make estimates for when these things uh, happen, uh, so here I've got log B versus log N, in black, I've got kind of typical parameters for the midplane of the solar nebula. You can see that ions become decoupled at densities to the uh, right of this line and electrons to the right of this line. So you can see that the Hall effect is going to be quite important uh, in protostellar disks. So moving on now to the particular application at hand, which is the uh, MRI. Um, this is the induction equation that you have to use instead of ideal MHD. And if we just restrict our attention to the, the simplest and highly degenerate case of a vertical magnetic field, uh, 
uh, and look at what happens. You get a dispersion relation. You usually think of it as maybe being a, uh, a quadratic in k squared and solve things this way. It also turns out that it's quite interesting to write the equation of a circle down instead and think about um, uh, curves on a uh, plane that has the Hall diffusivity at one axis and the Pedersen as the other. Kind of fun. I like circles. I can understand them. <laughs> I won't tell you how it took me a week to uh, work through <laughs> what all this meant, <laughs> but I won't share most of that with you. Uh, anyway, uh, by Hall, I've kind of rescaled things here, of course, so I'm using uh, omega, the disk frequency, as the uh, unit of frequency. K is the usual KVA over omega, and the uh, diffusivities have been scaled appropriately. And I buried the sign of BZ in here because you have this uh, sense of magnetic field dependence in the Hall term uh, in with the Hall thing there just to keep things simple. Okay. Uh, so if you plot or make a little this little diffusivity plane here uh, and look at the different kinds of behavior you get, so here's the, the normal thing that you see, which is the plot of growth rate versus wave number. Uh, the plane divides into these three different regimes with three different behaviors, right? So you have your usual inverted quadratic shape, uh, and then uh, in, region, in region one, in region two, you have this terrible situation, and in region three, where all wave numbers are unstable, which is a bit unpleasant as k goes to infinity. Uh, so you can wave your hands around and say, oh yes, other physics comes into play and kills things, which is true, but nevertheless, I like to work in a toy world where we don't have this other physics and like to understand that, and so that's, I find this mildly disturbing. Uh, okay, so that kind of nicely uh, partitions uh, this plane into these different kinds of behavior, though we'll be spending pretty much all our time in region one for the rest of the talk. So you can plot maximum growth rate on this plane. So that's represented by these contours, uh, labeled by the growth rate. Uh, and you can see they're actually nice straight lines in this plane, which is good. I understand straight lines as well as circles. There's a bit of curvature here that happens uh, because this is in the region where Instead of having a well-defined maximum to the growth rate, that happens for k equals infinity, which is a bit disturbing as well. <laughs> uh, but it's a, this is a nice way to visualize things. The, the thing to take away from this uh, plot is that if the Hall diffusivity dominates the Pedersen diffusivity, or is a, you know, a reasonable fraction of it, then you're going to have a maximum growth rate that's decent. Right? Unless you're down here in some funny region down. Uh, and that's important in protostellar disks because often it's the case that if you just ignore the Hall uh, coefficient, just ignore the Hall effect completely, you wouldn't necessarily expect to get much uh, linear growth of the MRI. But in fact, uh, if the Hall term is as important or dominates, then you can get growth. Oh, the, no, no, that's so, sorry, I should have mentioned. That, that does not affect the positions of these lines. It only affects this line here, which is, actually, I do need to make this point. Of course, you can't just do things in an unlimited fashion. You're talking about vertical perturbations in the disk, and you have this constraint on the wavelength. And this curve here just shows, uh, it limits the region in this plane you're actually ever allowed to inhabit because this is a, a circle, this is part of a circle that's specified by setting the growth rate to zero and kh bigger than one or equal to one. That gives you the circle, so you always have to lie within the circle if you're going to fit anything into the disk. Your growth rate won't necessarily be this maximum possible growth rate. Right, so that's a separate, I put too much on this plot actually is what happened. Okay, so uh, now let's kind of apply this to, I, I was going to say real protoplanetary disks, but that's an unfair representation, um, by putting in some of the numbers in the sense of considering the abundances of charged species in the, in the disk. So we assume a minimum mass solar nebula, make it isothermal vertically just to keep things simple. You've got ionization by cosmic rays, and I can, you can do, I don't really present any X-ray results here, but that's easy enough to include, with a simple reaction scheme uh, that simplifies the chemistry and boils it down to its essence, but it does include things like grain charging and so on, if you assume, who knows really on what basis, but some kind of uh, size distribution for the grains, uh, and evaluate the uh, 
components and see where things grow. So here's the X-ray ionization rate uh, just taken from Igea and Glasgow uh, compared to the canonical cosmic ray ionization rate. So this is pick your radius from the star, start at the surface of the disk, you've got high ionization rate, go in and some of the X-rays are attenuated and eventually cosmic rays dominate if you go deep enough into the disk. So that's your strongly stratified source of ionization. Simple reaction scheme. Uh, once you get, look, oh come on, it's just ODEs, right? You get a package, it solves them, and there's not a significant difference between two ODEs and 200 ODEs, and, you know, my little laptop will just do it, even though the equations are stiff. You know. They're not nasty ODEs. I can find some of those for you, but these aren't those. It's just chemistry. Usually tends to just run to equilibrium. Uh, and so here's uh, some results without, in this case, without grains. So this is abundances of different species versus height from the midplane. So this is the midplane and this is five scale heights. This is the ionization rate, just cosmic rays uh, and X-rays uh, together, I think, uh, as a function of depth into the disk. And you can see the electron abundance is quite high. Uh, and this is uh, the abundance of molecular ions, metal ions recombine slowly. So assuming that they're around in reasonable quantities, uh, then uh, the, their presence uh, with the electrons kind of determines the total abundance. Then you can evaluate the resistivity components. Firstly, look at the black curve. This is the ohmic resistivity that most of you know and love, or love to varying degrees. It doesn't depend on the magnetic field that you assume. For the other two components, we have to assume a magnetic field. So I've just given two curves for each. The amber polar diffusivity in blue for one gauss or 0.1 gauss. And the Hall diffusivity in red, again, for one gauss or 0.1 gauss. Main thing to take away, it depends on the field that you assume. And it varies by a few orders of mag. Everything varies by a few orders of magnitude over the disk thickness. Also, there's this black horizontal line, which uh, gives you some idea of when the diffusivity is so high that the magnetic field isn't going to play dice. Right? So on this side, you're okay. The diffusion coefficients are small. On the other side, they're too large. Uh, here's a more complicated plot that gives you every choice of magnetic field you might want to make. So it's the same. What I was presenting before were, were results for two horizontal cuts across this. Now we're allowed to choose any magnetic field strength we like according to that vertical axis and pick your height, and then this plot tells you stuff. So what does it tell you? Firstly, the shading tells you which kind of diffusivity is dominant, right? The purpley shade here tells you that ohmic resistivity dominates. The blue is Hall. The green is amber polar diffusion. Right? So if you start out on the midplane with uh, what's this, this is 0.01 Gauss, then you, you're in resist, the resistive kind of limit, then it goes Hall, then it goes amber polar as you go up through the disk. The contours uh, step, the factors of 10 steps in the magnitude of the largest diffusion coefficient. The solid contour is the critical value where if you have higher diffusivity than that, you're not coupled. So this side is uncoupled from the magnetic field, or the magnetic field is uncoupled. On this side, it is not. Yes, you probably need some. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? uh, ah, good. That would be about 20 Gauss at 1 AU, at the midplane. So the equipartition field, and this will actually show up in some. Yeah, yes, as opposed to equipartition with Okay, that's good. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> that's one nil, eh? Oh, they're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'll let Neil comment on that. No, 20, yes. I'll <laughs> that means I've got to get going, okay. I'm sorry, the, the critical curve is defined relative to what time scale? Well, it's eta equals HCS, so that's some kind of funny Reynolds number-y thing, right? So yeah, depend if you define. Yes, that's right. I hate. Well, I'm not going to use Reynolds number because I like to muddy the waters with different notation, and uh, there's been various definitions of Reynolds number thrown around over. So I just eta equals HCS. That's good, but that's kind of the 
minimalist requirement for any kind of coupling, it turns out. But it actually applies in this case. Oh, right, so here's the local MRI growth rate on that same plane. Uh, so you've got the scale at the top there uh, for that sa equivalent to that plot. So this is the maximum growth rate providing that you restrict yourself to wavelengths, you know, KH bigger than one locally, right? So these things kind of fit. Uh, so you can see that uh, you get strong growth. Uh, this is the equal partition limit here, so you can't, you know, you don't get anything on this side because you can't fit a wavelength into the disk at that point, right? So this is down, this is about 0.1 omega here. This gets to be 0.01 and 0.001, and this is kind of no growth in here this little region. So if you want to think about, suppose you start off with a little field and maybe it gets bigger and bigger because ever MRI happens, then that tends to shoot you up in that direction. So if you started here, maybe nothing happens. If you start here, then maybe things can amplify and bootstrap themselves. Or maybe not, but you need to do nonlinear simulations to do that. Uh, if you turn off Hall diffusion, this is the difference that happens. You get a much a uh, more extended region where nothing happens if you just neglect Hall diffusion entirely. Uh, I don't have time to talk about structure of modes, etc. Let's throw in grains. Grains really mess things up by soaking up electrons and reducing the conductivity. The effect is negligible up here where there's plenty of electrons. There's a critical depth where you soak up so many electrons, you really start to lose them and you can't actually uh, supply the grains with as many electrons as they'd like, so they don't get completely charged anymore, which is why these green curves, which is the abundance of different charge states, make th this transition. Below that transition, you've hardly got any electrons and grains don't move anywhere, so the conductivity drops by many orders of magnitude. These vertical lines are just giving you factors of 10 depression, uh, sorry, increase in the diffusivity, and you can see it's ohmic as a function of depth. So you can see there's many orders of magnitude. The only place that's going to be active is in this region here, this range of field strengths and these heights, because you're below this why critical you, uh, curve. Yeah, because we put, you've got this now this, you've got pretty much the same as before as far as electrons go. The electrons used to go like this, now they just plummet <laughs> by many orders of magnitude. That that increases the diffusivities by many orders of magnitude. The few grains that you've got that are charged are like little footballs that won't drift through the gas. They just lock the charge up, and so it doesn't give you anything. No conductivity from them. So that's the effect. The grains really kill you. right? And so you only get growth in that kind of uh, region. Uh, grow the grains to three microns, though. You've got less grains. They hold less charge. Same. Total mass constant, let's assume they're all three microns. Now you've improved things, right? You've still got a big dead zone here. Just because they have less grains. I have the same mass. I have, they have less capacity to soak up charge. Yeah, also there's a capacity for each grain to hold a charge too that depends on the size that you also bung in. It's a last slide, last slide, we'll get there. I'll see if I ever get there. Okay, so three microns. <laughs> <laughs> Three micron grains, let's go. Oh, now I'll go to 5 AU, no grains. Look, it's pretty much all unstable, right down to the mid plane. Uh, one micron grains now at 5 AU because, of course, you don't have the high densities. It's easy enough for the ionizing sources to get in, so things are kind of easier all around. Uh, and you can see that kind of for moderate-ish, but nowhere near equipartition fields, you can get activity happening. Uh, and if you take away the Hall effect, you've got a dead zone. So the Hall effect is really important out here. But I'm today's entrepreneur. Yes. Yes, that's all I'm doing. That's all I'm qualified to do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, people, they're, 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 actually, you don't. You just come along and you put your sign up. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> From what I can gather. But <laughs> uh, oh, I don't have time to talk about that, sorry. But that's all, it's all linear anyway. Okay, so... <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with it. Okay, so the executive summary, Hall diffusion is quite important uh, when there's no grains. The active layer, if I multiply by two because there's a top and a bottom, is around 1,700 grams per square centimeter, active in the linear sense, the word active. And um, 
if you add grains, that causes you all kinds of trouble. You know, you can really ma hardly have a much of an active layer at all. But if you grow grains at 1A up to 3 microns, you're up to 80 grams per square centimeter. That starts to get interesting in terms of an active surface density. 5AU is not too hard. If there's no cosmic rays, well, X-rays can do the job to reasonable amounts as long as there's not too many grains, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, increase the disk mass while we're talking surface density, so we're okay. Small grains uh, will really kill you. Yeah. Uh, so you have this issue. Wow. Uh, no, well, it, the, linear, the linear thing tells you that maybe nothing happens some of the time, and you probably believe that one, right, from the linear thing, right? Um, bigger than a, depends where you are. You want them a bit bigger than an iron because then the drag's a bit higher than an iron, right? But if the ions are, if you're at densities where the ions are locked, and so you take a lot of your electrons and stick them on grains that are roughly the same size as, uh, you know, their cross section for. Ah, uh, yeah, PA. Uh, yeah, PAHs are not not so good. You really do want electrons rather than anything else. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the thing is, you know. Grains accumulate and get bigger. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Trouble is, if there's a tail, but if there's a tail left behind, which there will be at some level, that you only need a little bit of mass in that tail to kill things. The important quantity, once you get beyond PAH size, so that there's a linear relationship between charge a grain gets and its size, um, is this integral here. Right. So you, it's not surface area actually. It's the it's the capacity of the grain population to hold electrons is what the important thing is. That's what you need to estimate. Okay. So, for example, if you, if you just have 10 to the minus 3 of a standard 0.1 micron grain population, that's your critical kind of number to be thinking about. Oh, and that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>
So if you just glance at that, you think, oh, the hall should be doing something here, and it's not. But there's another parameter that also has to have the right kind of condition as well to make things happen. So, so I would, my reading of it, and I might not, is that when you expect the hall effect to make a difference, it did in the, in the nonlinear simulations. And when there wasn't a difference, that was when you'd, much difference, that was when you'd expect there not to be a difference, based on the linear <laughs> analysis. <laughs> Yes, but this unfortunately is not the, that's the other sign of orientation of B compared to omega than that I've presented here. Yeah, so, I yeah. Don't know what this sign business is, but it's only yeah, either positive. My understanding of MRI, you know, yeah. that the reason why you have a maximum K is that you can't really bend the field line. You have a the point, it takes too much effort. So, how how are, how are you able to find modes in which. Hey, hey, it's not just me, but. Um, Well, I mean, firstly, there's no, I was going to say there's no, it doesn't quite answer your question. There's no dissipation associated with the whole thing. So you get to restructure the field for free in that sense, but you still have the bending. So uh, You don't have quite the same level of field freeze. Uh, right. Right. Well, are they saying the field doesn't bend? It slips. It doesn't bend as much as you think. Yes, <laughs> that, that's... Any bending you do... Yeah, but it's only B dot delta B or something we have to worry about, right? Because of the whole term, the whole term allows you to decouple the lines and there's no more field freeze, so it's pretty clear. So you can move the lines without having to move the field freeze. Yeah, but it's still a disturbance. Well, remember we... Uh, I, I, I'd need time to think of it. I'm sure it's there. <laughs> I'm just not finding it right now. Is it really circumstance where it starts varying to be dynamically interesting, or are just the sync for electrons? I think f they're really just the sync for electrons, I think, when I look at the numbers. So, so that is actually good in the sense, well, they're interesting dynamically in the sense the grain population evolves. Right. I mean, the drifts are small with the gas, but they do find, the grains find each other and bang and maybe stick or shatter, depending on what happens, and settle and so on and so on. And that, so they're very important in, in that kind of secular sense, because right, they affect the ionization stuff and they evolve. And I, th I think Neil's, I don't, are you going to do anything on that, Neil? A little, good, good. I'm looking forward to it. what you should have, S speaking of numbers, yeah. Um, well, they're sitting in a, you know, you can get a lot, there's different, I, I've had slides on this in other talks and didn't have time, but you can, you can make things up. So you know what field strength you need if magnetic fields are responsible for the accretion rates that are measured onto stars, for example, and that gives you uh, several Gauss at an AU. There's meteoritic evidence for several Gauss at an AU. Um, the equipartition field, as I mentioned, is maybe 18, 20 Gauss. That's an upper limit. You can get a lower limit that's kind of reasonable by just thinking, well, you're inside a cloud core that will have a 10 milligauss or so as well. So, so I would say 10 milligauss to 10 Gauss at 1 AU is, is certainly, you know, that'll be the range. But I'd expect a few Gauss just based on you want to try and do something interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.